Cranky Geek Fall 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors Google, Agora, Daily, Dolby IO, Element, Intel, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. So we have a new Cranky Geek sponsor that we're happy to have join us for the first time, Daily. So uh, Daily is a, a communications platform as a service that started a few years ago and actually you guys just raised $40 million. So congratulations on that. So uh, Maddie Ruth Backman, uh, she's a senior product engineer there, and she'll be walking us through a problem I know many of you have faced is how do you support your web receipt product across all different platforms? And with that, Maddie, I'll let you uh, take it away. I'll load up your slides here. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maddie Ruth Backman, and I'm an engineer at Daily, working all, on all sorts of projects there, but lately focused on the design of our new cross-platform APIs. So today I wanna to talk to you about that project, about both the process of why we have gone this direction and how. I can't remember what I was doing recently. I think it was reviewing uh, the umpteenth PR or bike shedding a function name for the fifth time. But it occurred to me that the process towards getting to a core library has really felt like a classic journey to a promised land or utopia. It has been long and there have been lots of dragons, but the end is here. And I imagine one day I'm simply going to wake up and a bird might be sitting on my shoulder. And then I'm going to look over to find tabs and spaces and Emacs and Vim users all quietly sipping tea together next to a fire. So in this talk, I'm going to take you through our steps in successfully completing this epic quest. First, we acknowledge the issues at hand in our world today. Next, we imagine our final destination and its qualities that make it uh, uh, qualify as a utopia. Then we consider our options and is it worth it and gather up our courage. And then finally, we embark on that journey. So what is our world today? Uh, a quick overview of what we do at Daily. We provide user-friendly WebRTC APIs and front-end libraries to help others build custom video applications, as well as a pre-built version that people can just plug and play. We also provide hosting infrastructure for those calls and, of course, the support and resources to support our customers and their customers. But there's something wrong with the world today. However, unlike Steven Tyler, we do know what it is. Uh, primarily, that is that we do not have native development support. We only support Web and React Native. This is a core customer requirement that's asked of us daily. and um, and so we just know we need to build it as a company. Uh, next, since the existing API has been around and grown organically, like many APIs, it has issues that naturally happen over time as you bolt on new features that weren't there to begin with, leading to inconsistencies. Our existing architecture requires the client to download a bundle when joining the call, which is small and not a big deal, but still it's something we want to improve on. And our engineering resources always feel stretched. I don't have to uh, think about, um, I don't think I have to say much here because everyone knows how that goes. So what is our utopia and what are the requirements of it? For us, the, our utopia has a few requirements. First, it has to support a plethora of web and native platforms. And the list seems to keep growing as new languages and platforms emerge. It should make the most of our engineering resources. It should impose a cohesive and consistent API across platforms, making it easier to document and easier to support. It needs to provide native binaries, which allows better release mechanisms and versioning support than we have today and overcomes our bundle download issue. It maximizes performance and efficiency across all platforms. And finally, it'd be nice if it could scratch our bellies. All right, so step three in the quest was to consider our options of where there were only, there were really only two we considered. Um, option one was to do like most people and simply build disparate solutions for every platform. This has the advantages of being able to release faster, not allow any one platform be bogged down by another since each platform would move at its own pace. All the problems here would be solved problems, anything we'd hit already solved and hiring is easier. The downside of this approach um, are you can you end up with diverging API designs and architectures, which often result in behavioral differences. 
You have a much larger surface area for testing and each platform requires its own maintenance and team. Also, feature development is asynchronous per platform. So every feature has to be built in times, tested in times, documented in times, et cetera. Option two is to build one core library with just a thin set of API wrappers for every platform you want to support. This has the benefit of reaching our utopia goal of enforcing a consistent API across platforms. It minimizes and unifies the majority of testing to one code base with minimal platform specific testing. It allows for a smaller team to build and support it. Also, any new feature development uh, features developed are built once and immediately or nearly immediately available on all platforms. And because of that last bullet, once the core library and architecture are in place, new feature developments should be faster. The downsides here are that this is untrodden territory, so there will be unsolved problems. All the platform releases are dependent on the core, so the initial releases will be slowed down. Any core bugs that get introduced will affect all the platforms. Hiring can be more difficult. And eventually, we'll have to port all our existing customers to, new, to the new API since it won't be compatible with the old. So we chose. Yeah, I guess we could guess based on the, well, <laughs> if people were paying attention to the uh, session title, maybe we'll figure it out. <laughs> Option two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There wouldn't be much of a talk if we chose one. <laughs> uh, but that's why we got here and, and why we chose to go with two. So option two, uh, why, you know, what made us really lean that way? The pros discussed in option two really make it easier for us to deliver on daily's two most important things. Uh, one, providing ergonomic and easy to use APIs for all developer customers. This option allows us to get the API quote unquote right and keep it consistent across all platforms. And two, every performance and quality improvement we make now and in the future will immediately apply to all platforms, helping us ensure that we are delivering top notch performance and quality across all supported platforms. The second reason for option two is that the sunk cost fallacy didn't apply, which I think is likely one of the big reasons a lot of people don't go with this approach. For one, we already face the need to stand up multiple platform stacks from scratch. Uh, we only have one stack that uh, today would be considered a sunk cost, and it can continue to serve our needs until the replacement is ready. Uh, even with that one stack, there were enough improvements we wanted to make that really rewriting it was already on the table. Uh, third reason for going with option two is, I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> we estimated that it wouldn't take significantly, uh, take significantly longer and would require less engineers than standing up two or more new stacks. And finally, we really believe in this approach and that it will last us 20 years and save significant time and energy across all of our efforts. So back to the journey, we finally gathered up the courage and started the journey, uh, which immediately started with what do we use to build the core? Uh, and there was really only two options. There's C, C++ or Rust, and we chose Rust. Why would we choose Rust? Because it's what all the cool kids are doing, right? No, not really. Just kidding. Uh, we <laughs> well, you, you guys are cool kids, I guess. That's a uh, account for something. <laughs> We chose it because Rust supports WebAssembly as a first-class platform. While it's possible to compile C++ to WASM, it wasn't designed that way. Um, also, with C++, the safety and memory management issues you always tend to have would become even harder to work with and debug as we scale across platforms. And again, we want this to last 20 years. Finally, there is a huge cognitive overhead that we remove when using Rust when dealing with concurrency and ensuring safety. As one of our developers said, he no longer uh, needs to worry about, did I add new texts and locks in all the right places that I need them? And what about possibly dangling pointers? Did I leave any of those around that could lead to data races or outright seg faults? Since the Rust compiler simply won't allow these things to happen, those nightmare invoking thoughts just go away. So what does the stack look like? On web, we have the browser WebRTC and MediaSoup client SDKs that our daily core Rust code depends on, then that is all bundled with the FFI layer using WASM FindGen. FFI is the foreign function interface. I'd go into that, but I don't have time, so I recommend Google. <laughs> and finally, there's the top level thin TypeScript layer with our public API. 
On native, it looks similar, except that we have another FFI layer and custom LibWebRTC and media suit client wrappers that the daily core depends on. Our custom WebRTC is primarily just a set of shims that make it possible for our Rust code to interoperate with the C++ WebRTC API, since Rust can only talk to C. To do this, we have a simple C wrapper layer on top of it, and with that, we can auto-generate safe Rust bindings. The primary things we do uh, in these shims are turn WebRTC smart pointers into regular pointers and shim C++ classes to overcome the mismatch between inheritance and C++ and composition and Rust. <clears throat> we do have one minor actual patch to WebRTC, but its purpose is simply to allow us to better integrate with our build system and tools. <clears throat> so back to the journey. Like every epic journey, there be dragons. <clears throat> Top of mind for me, since this is what I primarily work on, is getting the API right. Getting it to be consistent and ergonomic across all platforms is really hard. Each platform has sometimes opposing design principles and common practices, nuanced behavioral differences across otherwise equivalent types. Event handling, not only is it different on each platform, but each one typically builds it in a number of ways. So which one do you choose? And there, uh, finally, there can be inherent differences across platforms with regards to things like device permissions and rendering. Second dragon, uh, WebAssembly is right now single threaded, assuming you're not using web workers, which we're not. And uh, desktop and mobile platforms, uh, you can and want to use multiple threads. Uh, third dragon, another dragon is the fact that much of the WASM related tooling is new and requires work. For example, we use WASM pack to generate NPM packages from our Rust code. And WASM pack lets us test our code via WASM bindgen test runner. But the test runner doesn't know how to load the other ES6 modules we depend on, so we can't actually run the test right now. Um, Finally, overcoming platform differences when passing objects over the FFI chasm has proven difficult due to memory management differences, ABI stability, and types differences. So for instance, the ABI st stability. ABI is the application binary interface. Think of it as the API at the binary level and how your compiled binaries are able to link to each other and find what they're looking for. ABI of REST, C++, and Objective-C++ is not stable across releases. So we can't depend on passing or receiving values from these languages in registers or on the stack. So to avoid this, we ensure that all the values we pass over the FFI chasm are C compatible. I think it's time for some code. <laughs> so here is a diagram loosely showing the languages we work with on native and how they can talk to each other. Each yeah, language- I, I love how you chose to do ASCII diagrams too. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's easiest. Each language can only talk to another language that it touches. So for instance, Swift can talk to C and Objective-C, but not C++ or Rust. Given that, uh, you would think that the jump from Swift to Rust would be as simple as compiling Rust bindings to C, making it a small skip like so. But <laughs> our Swift API actually depends on both the Rust core and WebRTC framework. And since the WebRTC framework is an Objective-C++, we have to go a roundabout way to get to Rust through Objective-C, like so. Oh. Quite the journey. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so we'll take just a quick example. Uh, here, we are creating Daily's top-level object that all our public API lives off of. Um, in its initializer, we create a new type, the DL call client. All our public API functions simply wrap this type like so. The DL call client is an objective C type. So we've now crossed that first boundary. It holds on to a C++ pointer to our primary Rust call type and initializes it via an initializing function, that daily core call in it. That function is written in Rust. But whoa, Maddie, you just skipped right past C++ and C. This, again, is due to compiler and FFI magic. So going back to the Objective-C slide. Since Objective-C is basically a superset of C++, and C++ is inherently compatible with C, 
All we functionally need to do here is ensure that our public headers and function signatures in Rust are C compatible. All right, so now that we've made the jump to Rust, you can see our primary type, the daily call. In its initializer, we do a bunch of stuff, including creating the instance of WebRTC and media soup. In our WebRTC's context initializer, we set up our own pure connection factory. This type is again in Rust, but it is where we finally call out to our custom C++ WebRTC shims to actually do the peer connection call, uh, peer connection factory call. So now we finally made the last leap to interoperate with WebRTC. You'll see the shim is simply turning, uh, turning the smart pointer we get from WebRTC's create modular peer connection factory, that's a mouthful, into a C pointer, making it digestible in Rust. Voila. All right, if you're still with me, there's good news. We have also uh, encountered a bunch of knights in rusty armor. For one, the core logic really is write once, run everywhere, and this is a huge deal. Second, Rust provides data validation for free for us. For instance, we use Serde to correctly serialize and deserialize JSON, which is the main inter -type, uh, interface type with libmedia soup. Also, remember the dragon about overcoming the fact that our WASM is single-threaded, but native platforms are multi-threaded. Turns out that Rust's async await tools just handle that for us, and we can express concurrent logic completely agnostic to, to the fact whether it is uh, actually is or not. There's a little uh, asterisk there, but primarily that's true. And finally, I'd be a fool not to mention the incredible team that has been working on this project. So that's where we are today. We have not totally completed the journey, but we have slayed the biggest dragons and proven our path. I can see the green pastures on the horizon. Um, we have working MVPs on native iOS, Mac OS, Android, and web with promising performance. And we are currently releasing to a few select customers. We aim to have a general release of Android and iOS APIs soon. Thanks. Cranky Geeks Fall. 2021 WebRTC event as possible thanks to our sponsors. Daily, build communications into any application. Google and WebRTC.org supporting web real-time communications. Agora, the real-time engagement platform. Dolby I.O., the API of sight and sound. Element, use the matrix open protocol to support real-time collaboration. Intel, offering a scalable open source media server and Ring Central revolutionize your communications with the Ring Central APIs.